Praise the Lord, everybody. If we can all stand. Excuse the fact I don't have a jacket, but the Bible does say be ready in season and out of season. Amen. So I think I just learned a valuable lesson today. also said that his miracles were too numerous to mention. And as I look around this room, I see miracle, Brother Brandon, I see miracle, I see miracle, I see miracle, I see miracle, all over this place. So what I want us to do today is I want us to worship God like that miracle has already happened in our life. Like that miracle has happened in our body. That miracle has happened in our finances. That miracle has already happened. And let's worship God for it today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we're going to come down and we're going to worship
holy ground Chains fall Fear Now Here Now Jesus you
Jesus, you change everything. Let's just take a moment right now. If Jesus has changed everything in your life, raise your hand and raise your voice all over this place right now. God, we thank you today, Lord. We thank you for changing everything for us, God. Lord, we thank you for the healing that you've given us, God. We thank you for the blessings. him with any questions for that. The same day is a women's dinner. Okay, one person's going <laughs> at the Bone Island Grill over in Vandercook. See Sister Heather for any information on that. I think that's at 530 that night. So while the men are gone, the women will go and eat. Okay, no response there. <laughs> Church camp is coming up. Who's excited for that? Yeah. July 31st through August 4th, church camp is filling up quick for the rooms. See Sister Heather with any questions or anybody in leadership will take care of you. There's a registration forms in the hallway right out the hallway out front. And finally, our big one, the fireworks tent. It's a lot of work, but we also have a lot of fun, all right? I, I promise you it's a lot of fun. The work is worth the fun, amen? And if you have any questions, see Brother Lando about that. There's sign-up sheets for that over by the front door. So as soon as you walk in, sign, sign up for something. It, it helps and it goes a long way. Amen. Amen. If we can all stand, we'll take our Wednesday night tithes and offerings. Pastor Bass, please pray. week, uh, but it seems like you get a lot of bass every week, so maybe we're used to it. Uh, I did want to say uh, Uncle Waylon did a great job last yeah. night. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It was, it was something, he's, he's, he said something the other day, he said, well, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to tell my story, but when he got behind the microphone, he started talking, it turned into, I'm going to tell my testimony, and there's something different between a story and a testimony, amen? Amen. 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 Did a great job, proud of him, did great, glad I got to hear it, Amen. Amen. I won't take your time up too long tonight, so if you would, stand with me. Turn to uh, Exodus chapter number 4, and we're going to begin in verse number 10. It's a very familiar part of Scripture, but I'm going to teach on it just a little bit sideways. Most of the time we come straight at it. I'm going to come at it from a little bit different angle, I hope. Um, say amen if you got it tonight. Amen. Amen. The board counts. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore. That made me laugh when I read it. He said he wasn't eloquent and then immediately said neither heretofore. Um, Nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and a slow tongue. In verse number 11, Then the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? And who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Verse number 12 says, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Verse number 13, and he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by hand of whom thou wilt send. 
And uh, verse number 14 says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. I don't think that was on accident. Amen. I think God already knew. There was already providence in what he was saying. Amen. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Verse number 15. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be thy mouth with, and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. I want to teach to us tonight, the title of my sermon is The High Cost of Low Expectations. So if you would, put your Bibles down for me, raise your hands, raise your voices, and let's get a hold of God tonight. God, you would lead us in your way tonight, God. God, your anointing would shine through tonight, God. God, you would hear us tonight, God. God, you would hear your word tonight, God. God, you would move in somebody's heart, God, move in somebody's life right now, God. God, you would open pathways, God, open opportunities, God. Hand out burdens tonight, God. God, break generational curses tonight. Yes, Lord. Everybody say amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for being seated tonight. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Um, I was thinking about this, and um, I started looking up expectations and all this kind of stuff. And there is something that stuck out to me about this story. I bet all the way through Moses' life, like, I, I don't know about you, but there are some things I know I'm not good at. So I automatically cancel those off in my mind. And if you had told Moses, when you grow up, you're going to be a mouthpiece for the Lord, I don't think he would have believed me. I don't think he would have said, yeah, that feels right. He wouldn't have said, yeah, that's exactly what I feel equipped to do. But there's so many times that we fall into that same trap. Or we take some of these things and say, well, I'll never be that. I'll never be that, I'll never be that, and I'll never be that. How come we sell ourselves short so often? Moses sold himself short, and even more so, he sold what God could do through him. All right. Moses ended up leading two to five million people out of slavery, right. out of the world, right. into the truth. All right. A man with a speech impediment. All right. That should tell you, and if you read your word, this happens more than once. Right. Not just with a speech impediment, but the thing you feel the least qualified to do, that's what God wants you to do. God used David, even against all odds, to kill a giant. It always made me laugh because God could have made David a giant as well. He could have been an absolute monster. But that wasn't the point of the story. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? It could have been a Goliath versus Goliath situation. That doesn't sound as good, does it? Now we have the David versus Goliath, the small triumphing over the huge. There is something to be said whenever we step into that realm. Because right now it says, if you ask me to do A, B, or C, I'll do it. But if you ask me to do D, E, and F, I'm out. You're already cutting your options down. You're saying, God, I believe I can do this because I'm talented in this. God did not call you because of your talent. He called you because of your anointing. There is something different. There is something you can't fake. There is something that talent will only get you so far. Talent will get you some attention. But there is something about anointing that there is some authenticity to it. There is some genuine move of God. I don't care how talented you are. There is something that replaces talent when you get a hold of God. When the anointing makes the change, there is something that changes in you forever. When you taste what that is, talent can't cut it anymore. Whenever you get a hold of that anointing for the first time, I would say most of our preachers up here remember, and our teachers, they remember that first time they got behind the pulpit and they felt that anointing. One of the most eloquent preachers I know, Pastor Shine Dowdy, he said the first time he ever started to feel the Holy Ghost behind the pulpit, all he could do was jump. He couldn't say, he said, it's the worst message he's ever preached. He couldn't, he couldn't get his message across at all. All he could do was stand there and worship because it went from being talented, and he's extremely talented, but it crossed this divide. Now we're moving into anointing. There are some of us sitting under the sound of my voice tonight that you are at a crossroads. Talent can only take you so far, and God
God is saying, I got an anointing for you. It's right on the other side of sacrifice. If you lay this down, if you take one more step towards me, the anointing is waiting for you. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I feel it strong right now. God is trying to call somebody tonight that you have made it off talent. God is saying, in what area your talent is at, that's not your calling. Quiet then. I knew that was coming. That's all right. You know what amazed me about this story the more I read it? All the way through it, there was miracles, signs, wonders. God never healed his speech impediment. Not one time. Never even mentioned it after this, to the best of my knowledge. In, in, my, in my study of it, he never mentioned it again. The thing that you use to disqualify you, God lets you get over, and then we move on. Amen? Now, there, there's a whole message in that. But I'm just going to hit it real quick. Stop disqualifying yourself because of what you assume is a mistake. You assume what is a defect. You assume is a failure. God is saying, I can use it. I, I know you messed up. I know you missed it. I know you feel like you come up short, but I still got something for you. I know you feel like you walked away and you missed it. I know it feels like you backslided twice. I still got a call. I still got a spot in heaven for you. There's something else that I have for you. Don't miss it because you disqualify you. The world and the devil is living rent-free in your head. They're saying, how dare you think you could do something for the Lord? Who do you think you are? It's not who I think I am. And it's never who Moses thought he was. It was who he had in his corner. It was who I had on my team. It was who I had backing me up. Because I couldn't come out here and preach with such confidence if I hadn't already went through this down in the youth room and felt the Holy Ghost and I felt the anointing and say, this is exactly what you need to preach tonight. Can I get an amen from my preachers? Because sometimes you'll have a good thought, but a good thought does not equal a message. Amen? Some of you will learn that as you go, right? Some of you know that already. Because I've heard good messages, but I've also heard a word from the Lord. I was down here and I brought Audrey over. I don't get to worship with her a whole lot because Logan's a slacker. But I don't get to worship with her all the time, so I pulled her over there and she hugged me up and said, I think we're going to hear a good word tonight. <laughs> There's something about training up that generation. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? The defect was never a disqualification. Your defect is not a disqualification. I hope everybody hears what I'm saying tonight, and not just hear it, but I hope you take it personal. I am talking to you tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I hope somebody's here. I don't know why I'm caught up on this point right now. I got, I got plenty of other to preach. But there's a disqualification in your mind. There is something saying, well, I've messed up too bad. I've gone too far. I've done too much. I've ruined what God could have used. I came up short. Let me tell you something, just for a moment. As someone who raised up in this, I was born and bred in it. I, I, I've known it since I was in diapers. Right. But there is nothing more powerful than someone coming from nothing. Yeah. Someone coming from less than nothing. They right. felt like they were less than nothing. And they come and God starts to work on them. And God starts putting a little talent in them. And God starts multiplying what he puts in there. And you see somebody get a hold of God that never knew God before. Right. They got no right. Right? The people who believe in these pedigrees and apostolic pedigrees, you can throw that straight out of the window. Amen? As somebody who has one, I promise you it doesn't do me any good. Amen? Think about it. Because when you get up here, I can't just say, hey, my last name's Bass. Please come get the Holy Ghost. That's not how this works. Amen? That's not how this works. I've seen people come from absolutely nothing who their parents and their parents' parents and their parents' parents' parents had no right to be behind the pulpit right. until they had an anointing, right. until they had a move of God, right. until they had an altar, and then they have just as much right as any other man or woman on the planet to get behind the pulpit and bring the word of God. There is something that God has not disqualified you for what you are reaching for. All right, all right. Don't help the devil disqualify you tonight. All right, all right, all right. Don't believe that lie. All right. 
The devil is telling you a lie that you've messed up too much. Nobody's going to want to hear what you have to say. And I've thought about this a lot. Is that when I tell Logan, and I tell Logan a lot, whether he hears anything, I don't know. But I tell him a lot. And there's only so much my ministry can tell him. Because I haven't been down the roads that everybody here has been down. I haven't made the mistakes, some of the mistakes, that we heard about last night during a testimony. I can't tell you what that's like. But you need somebody to come along who can. Somebody who made those mistakes and came back. Somebody who never was supposed to be here in the first place and said, Logan, don't go down that road. I know where it goes. Don't sell your testimony short. Your testimony is just as important as mine, if not more so. Because I can tell him what's, what's on the right side. If you live for God, this is what you can look forward to. Kimmy, if you live for God, I can tell you what that life looks like. But there's other testimonies in the church that can tell you what can happen if you don't. And what happens if we leave them not knowing what could happen if they don't. Because I believe God set it up where you need a heaven to run to, but you also need a hell to run away from. And some of you have came from that life where it felt like hell on earth, and you lived through it anyway, and you're sitting in the same church I'm in tonight. Amen? You have every right to tell your testimony as much as I do to these young people. When they're looking for it, when they're hurting, you can say, I remember when I was there. I've never lived through cancer. Amen? But whenever that comes up in the church, that's when your testimony is important. Whenever you see somebody going through something you went through, whenever you... Uncle Waylon talked to, to the young men specifically for a point last night. He was trying to reach out because I believe Uncle Waylon wished he had somebody to reach out to him when he was 30 years old, when he was 20 years old, when he was 19 years old. So now he's turning around telling his testimony to Steve, to Brandon, to Austin, to Logan, to all of these people, right? Your testimony isn't dead yet. If you're still on this side, you can still do some good, some ministering for the kingdom. It's not about us. It's not about Lando. It's not about Brother Danny. It's not about Pastor Bass. It's about what God can do through them if you let him. If you let him. If you let him. A lot of the problem is, and I want to reference verse number 15 here real fast. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words into his mouth, and I will be with thee. Or I will be with thy mouth. I will be. Not I am. I will be. What is he trying to say? What is he trying to tell Moses? So I'm with you now, and you know that. You can hear my voice. You understand who I am. And when you go and stand in front of the Pharaoh with your speech impediment, I'll be with you there as well. I will be with you there as well. There's so many situations I would have loved to have known the answer before I started the journey. I would love to go back to, what year is it? 2023. I would love to go back to 2017 Lando and say, oh, by the way, when this comes up, handle it this way. Handle it that way. But we don't have that option. We have to handle it in the best way we know how and trust. And trust that he will be with us. He will be with us when we go through the times. When we stand in front of the Pharaoh, God will be with us. And that was the biggest test that Moses had to go through at the time. (laughs) If you read Moses, he, he goes through quite a bit. Well, read that whole story. I'd take you a little while. That's a, that's a good Bible study. Amen? Amen? But something we have to understand is that we're not just doing it for us. Moses wasn't just doing it for him. He had to understand, and I know, I, I feel like I hit this at least every other time I preach, but it's on my heart. I, I'm, not, I'm not just concocting something. It's on my heart. But there's something that we have to do in order for the youth to come up the way we want them to. If you want them to be in a more worship-filled church, fill your church with worship. Amen? Nobody else is going to do it in your stead. If you want your kids to worship, you worship. 
I'm not, I'm not saying this as, as a parent. Obviously, I don't have any authority in that area. But as a youth pastor, I do. Right. And I've, been to, I've been to church after church after church. And I've seen that if the parents worship, the kids will worship. Come on, if the parents will pray, the kids will pray. If the parents will move and work on their anointing, even if you think it's small, yeah. even if you think it's, it's, it's almost even unnoticeable, right. there is something about growth that spirals. All right. Growth spirals and so does failure. Yeah, that's right. And as soon as the failure starts, it just cascades on them right. over and over. And that's the one we want to focus on, but so does success. Right. So does success. Yes, now we have to be able to understand our limitation, our, our expectations. I yes. apologize. Yes. If, if I go into the gym one day and I bench press 250, and then the next day I go in, well, I worked out yesterday, I should be able to hit 300 today. I'm going to smash my skull in with a, with a barbell. It's not going to go well, right. Right? right? Hope everybody can understand my analogy, right. right? If you go in thinking by tomorrow, I'm going to know as much scripture as Bishop. Right. No, you're not. No, you're, not. you're not going to. I mean, unless you're Sheldon from Big yeah. Bang Theory and you can just remember it, right? But I don't think you are, no. okay? Logan, you're not, right? <laughs> but Lando ain't either, don't worry, okay? But there are going to come times where how did Bishop get there? He didn't have Sheldon's memory. Well, it felt like sometimes he did. But he didn't have Sheldon's memory either, yeah. right? He had to work at it day by day by day. And we fall into what, I'm, what I like to call the fall of Naaman, yeah. where we want to go do the great things. We want to preach the conferences. We want to do all these things. We want to win all our family, and obviously we do. We want to win all these things, and we want to do these huge things, but you don't do the huge things until you can handle and master the small things. If you can't pray, you can't preach. All right. All right. You can give a message, yeah. but you can't preach. You can't minister All if you're right. not praying. All if right. you're not in communing with God, how are you possibly going to usher in the presence of the Holy Ghost when you're giving a Bible study, right. when you're talking to your friend at work, when whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is that you're doing, you have to be in communion with God. There has to be that. Amen? We have to understand that. But the next generation has to know who we are. And they don't listen to what you say. Amen? All of my parents said amen. They don't listen to what you say. They watch what you do. Because you might be able to fool everybody else on the planet. But those kids, Brother Danny, they know who you are. They know who you are. The youth, they know who you are. The youth know who I am. Right? You know, especially Logan. You know why? Because he can't get away from me. Right? I'm at softball. I'm at the tent. I'm everywhere he goes. This Friday, I'm going to be there. Right? And so is he. Can't get away from me. He knows who I am. So if I want them to be authentic, I have to be authentic. If you want your kids to love God authentically, you have to love God authentically. You have to, you have to, uh, I should have wrote it down. You have to show. You have to emulate. There's the word I was looking for. You have to emulate, then they will copy. Because that's what kids do. Most kids are, they just, hey, monkey see, monkey do. Right? Over and over. When I was in the school, I hated it when that stuff would happen. One kid would ask to go to the bathroom. All of a sudden, the whole class has to go to the bathroom. Right? As soon as it comes up, well, I need to go to the bathroom too. I need to go. Well, let's just all go. Let's just all do it right now. Right? So much so that me and my coworker, uh, over at um, over at, on Deer, or, uh, Detman Road, we had a hand sign for it, so that way we didn't have to say it out loud. Because we said out loud, we have to take everybody, yeah. right? We shut the whole thing down. Yeah. If you mentioned about, mom, you know, you're laughing awful hard. You know, <laughs> Sister Robin, I'm sure you know. Yeah. When those kiddos, they hear one person's going to recess, everybody's going to recess, right? right? Yeah. They are copiers. Use that to your advantage, yeah. but you have to put in the work. Yeah. Right. You can't just tell them, hey, go pray take them to go pray. Yeah, I remember on. now, as a 31-year-old, I remember mom literally dragging me into the prayer room. Absolutely. And you would think, oh, you are probably five or six. No, I was 14. Right? <laughs> I don't want to go in the prayer room. Right? I had the Holy Ghost, but I was still 14. Yeah, right? Yeah. I was, I've been there, Logan, where I've been exhausted from two-a-days, and mom's like, no, we're going to the prayer room. So guess what? We're going to the prayer room. Whether I wanted to or not. Right? Mom would say, give me five minutes. Then it would get in there, give me five more minutes. 
Uh, I see what's happening here. Yeah, I, I, got, I got played a bunch in that situation. But I, I'm thankful for it now. I didn't understand it then and certainly younger. You know, at 14, I, I kind of understood what was going on. But at 6, I didn't really know what was going on. But by the time I turned 18, 19, 20, I would find myself showing up early for church and just going to the prayer room. Why? That's what we did. It was ingrained in me. I, whenever they said, hey, prayer's at 6.15, I was like, okay, church starts at 6.15. Right? I'm talking about our MCs there, right? It starts at 6.15. If you would like to get more out of your service, start in prayer. All right. Amen? All right. Start in prayer and take it serious as yes. best you can. Yes. Amen? I'm not saying you got to yell and be loud and all that, but make a point that you get a hold of God while you're in there. Yes. Amen? Make a point. Take it serious. Be authentic. Be genuine when you go in there. And tell me it doesn't change how your services go. All right. Amen? Amen? But if we're going to be an a emulation, we have to do what's right. Because not only do they copy you when you do what's right, they definitely copy you when you do what's wrong. Amen? <clears throat> it, doesn't, it, it takes a long time to build up credibility, and it takes about five seconds to lose it, to destroy everything you just built, right? I remember I was living it as hard as I could at the time, and I had a high school friend who said, Lando's a good apostolic until he gets mad. He was my best friend on the planet, and that's what he said. And it wasn't because he was wrong or being mean. It was because he was right and he saw right through it. Right. Is that I was doing my best until I got mad. Yeah. And that bass temper would flare up. <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, we're going to throw us a bass fit. Yeah. Right? We're going to have a problem somewhere. We're going to have a problem at Denny's. Whatever yeah. it is. Right? Yeah. We're going to have a problem. Yeah. But I had to grow out of that. I had to mature out of that. And right. now when I talk to him, he says, how's church going? He doesn't believe in church. He, he doesn't want no part of it. But he asked me how church is going. Because he understands there was a change somewhere in there where it went from just being talented and knowing what's going on and knowing how to act and knowing how to church, so to speak, to going from an anointed. And there's a difference there. And you think your family doesn't notice when there's an authentic touch in your life because you walk with that flame of the Holy Ghost shut up in your bones. Amen? And you take it everywhere with you that you go. Don't sell your testimony short. Don't just expect your family to stay lost. All right. There is a turn that should be in your heart that I believe, and I felt this when I was praying, that somebody in here, maybe several somebodies, when they invite their family, they expect a no. Yeah. They expect them to say no. Yeah. And I'm not coming down on it. I'm, I'm trying to encourage you. That don't just expect a no. When you invite your friends from school, Cammie, don't expect a no. Look forward to a yes. Pray about a yes. Don't just do it flippantly. Amen? Whenever you do it, have something in mind. I want this person to come, and I want them to end up next to me. I want them to sit right next to me. Worship just as hard as I am. Yeah. Amen? There's an expectation every time we come to service. There has to be. There is, whether you want there to be or not. The expectation will fill it. Right? <clears throat> there is something that we do as humans. We base our expectations off our past a lot of times. That we say, well, this is what happened last time. This is what will happen this time. And this is what will happen the time after that. And we, Especially when we go through a rough time in life, we say, well, last time I tried this, I failed. The time before that, I failed. And the time before that, I failed as well. But if you start expecting... I'm going to give the best I can. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I talk to the youth about all the time. I don't need you to be perfect. I need you to be the best you can be. Right. You're still going to be human. You're still going to fail. You're still going to come up short. But are you doing the best you can? And I want to honestly ask Apostolic Tabernacle, are you doing the best you can? The dead level best that you can. Is it tiring? Absolutely. Yeah. Is it mentally exhausting? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you feel like you fail more than you succeed? Absolutely. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is nothing that replaces it. I feel like I've, I've succeeded at a good amount of things in my life, but whenever I have somebody come up to the altar and pray through and reach new levels and they start changing the way they're acting, changing the way the trajectory of their life, there's nothing that even comes close to it. If you've never had that happen, keep pushing because we're all called to be soul winners. Every single one of us are called to be soul winners. You could win somebody. 
Amen? Amen. You could win somebody. You could be an Aaron to a Moses. Amen. All right. You could be an Andrew to a Paul. Amen? Amen. You could be or Andrew to a Peter. I apologize. Andrew oh. to a Peter. You could be these people. You could make a difference in someone's life, and not just their life, but for an eternity. What do you expect when you come to church? And not what do you expect out of church. What do you expect out of you? Do you expect to be a worshiper? Because people will live up to your expectations, and they will also live down to your expectations. Especially children. If you set the bar low on your children... You're going to pay a price. Yes. There's a high cost to, pray, to pay whenever you set your bar low. Oh, yes. Whenever you set your bar low, I, I just want my kids to, to graduate high school. Just graduate. I don't care. Now, there's some situations, just graduate. Right. I get it. I, I'm with you, right? But is that it? What about after that? I want you to go further. Don't just graduate college. I expect that. That's the minimum, yeah. right? Especially That's in today's day and age, I feel like the minimum has, has went up. I hope so, right? And I hope as a church people, we expect more out of our children, out of our children and out of ourselves. There has to be more than I expect. Amen? Amen. I have an expectation that I'm going to be a little bit better at whatever it is that I'm doing. Every time I fail, I'm going to get a little bit better at it. Yeah. And I hate failure. I hate losing. I hate any of that kind of yeah. stuff. But it's necessary. Right. It's necessary. If you want to get better at something, you got to start somewhere. All right. Amen? Amen. If you would, stand with me tonight. I want to know where you expect to be in six months, spiritually. Where do you expect your family to be?